Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Nobody Asked Me Guy show. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, you guys know how we roll on this show. You know, we don't we don't waste people's time uh, talking about a lot of nonsense and, and, and uh, uh, being disrespectful to people and that kind of thing. We always allow everybody the opportunity. We, we are talking about this evening, leadership, legacy, and legends successfully navigating hostile environments. Now, all of us can understand that people always have a play on words and they love to play on words but you have two gentlemen here with you tonight that are certainly leaders they have certainly built a legacy and they are certainly legends and the, and the young man uh with that's wearing the texas hat that young brother uh was inspired to continue his his deed because of brother doug william let's jump right in now first of all guys we have on our set tonight that's with us uh, uh, Mr. Doug Williams, uh, uh, NFL MVP, Super Bowl 22. But guys, we're going to talk about Doug Williams, the man. We have uh, Donnie Little has been kind enough to join us. Uh, Donnie is the first African American quarterback at first uh, to uh, start and lead the University of Texas to a number one uh, in the country at a, at a, at a, a time in his career, and uh, he loved uh, and still love, I'm sure. Uh, our beloved Doug Williams, that he wanted to go to Grambling as a man. I don't want to make the Texas fans mad, but uh, we were really trying to get to Grambling, and, and Dunning can, can talk about that uh, as we move a little forward, uh, you know, because of the man that, that Doug is. So, guys, listen, I want you guys to know right now that I'm not going to give you a whole resume uh, on Dunning because uh, uh, Dunning, you can look both of these men up on, on uh, YouTube and Facebook and that kind of thing. So, in interest of time, and respecting their time, we're going to jump right into it. Mr. Williams, good evening, sir. Good evening. Hey, Donnie, how you doing? Doing good, Doug. How are you, buddy? Good. Donnie, what was your number over there? Number three? One. One. I know it was one or three. Hell, I remember. <laughs> number one, bro. I know yeah. somewhere in there. <laughs> well, man, I, actually, I wanted to thank you because, because of you, I wanted to play quarterback. Because of you, that. I wanted to go to Grambling. You didn't even have to buy me a car. I just wanted a 10th <laughs> we, we wouldn't have been able to do it anyway, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, your success. I grew up, you know, obviously, watching James Harris. And, oh, man, yeah. I tell you, just, 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 just as a trailblazer when you went to the Buccaneers and, you know, you took them out to Stella and just – you know, they got people around you, and here's a black man doing a thing that, uh, you know, a lot of white people been doing, and, you know, we got to be Superman at that position just to get that opportunity. So uh, I really want to thank you. I want to really thank you, brother, for inspiring me. Thank you. Appreciate what you did, too. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Right. Well, listen, gentlemen, see, see, this is good stuff. Why is it good stuff? Because any time... Ladies and gentlemen, you have men, and and let me say what a lot of people are afraid to say. Anytime you have black men coming together, showing you some positivity, showing you success, then it continues to tear down the walls of all of that craziness and all of that insanity uh, that people keep trying to talk about. And and I was just noticing today on on uh, NFL football uh, when one gentleman was referring uh, to the young quarterback over at uh, Texas, and 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 one he couldn't help himself. But talking, I uh, started talking about, yeah, you know, well, he, he's a a good quarterback, but you know, he uh, uh, mentally maybe he process things better. It's embedded in their DNA to not be able to give young African American quarterbacks, old African American quarterbacks, their due without trying to sneak in some kind of racial overtones, and that is why you guys are so blessed tonight, guys to have these two gentlemen with us. Now, listen, let me just kind of, I said I was going to jump in a minute ago, but I want to give these gentlemen an opportunity to, to say their hellos to one another. And uh, Brother Doug, let, let me start with you, man. You know, I'd like to ask, you know, now that you've gone through this athletic storm and that athletic storm of being a black quarterback, you know, uh, uh, how does being the first at a position that was reserved for our less melanated brothers in your sport you know, successfully, I might add, compared to being a black man in America? Well, you know, I think it 
I think number one is, is, is how you grew up. You know, I, I came from a strong family. Mom, dad, had an older brother who had gone to Grambling that made sure that um, I did what I had to do. And then it was fortunate enough to go to Grambling and, and play for a guy that, that gave us and instilled in us uh, that every man is born equal to become unequal. And never because we the color of our skin, he never once said what we couldn't, couldn't do, I can't do. It was all about an opportunity. And when we left Grambling, we, we felt like we can do anything anybody else can do, no matter where they went to school. And, and Coach Rob used to always say, it's blocking and it's tackling. If you can play football at Grambling, you can play anywhere. So that's the mentality that we had. We never doubted ourselves that from a mental standpoint that we wasn't capable. Uh, that's something that we don't do, and we don't do that today. I don't think any young guy, no matter where he plays in the league, in, in the NFL, at colleges, or look at themselves where they can't process stuff. It's easy for people to say that, but they don't know the mindset of the individual that's back back there. And the most important thing is opportunity. And that's all we ever ask for is an opportunity. And it's unfortunate, you know, even before my time, there was guys way before me that, that deserved an opportunity that they just didn't get them, you know. And I think that's the, the travesty of the whole thing. Like I was on an interview, um, just just yesterday with Jeremy Schaff. And and that was one of the things we was talking about was was, you know, guys going to HBCUs. Where when you look at this thing in, in Southwest Conference where where Donnie was was fortunate enough to play in, at one time blacks weren't allowed to play in there. Could That's you right. imagine how many great players and quarterbacks that they missed out on like today? You know, every just about every major college in the country trying to get Get that black guy to play who can play because you know what they bring so much to the table right. you know and, and they, they don't want to give them all the the cliches of being mentally tough but they're always going to say he's athletic I'm not saying that he meant them and, and and that just goes with it it's something that we have to overcome and go out and produce and i look at these guys in the, in the national football league now the watson um my man at dallas and wilson and Winston and 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 and, and um, Mahomes, you know, these guys can play. All they ever ask for is an opportunity. I think yeah. the mentality has to change. The good old boy mentality has to go by the wayside to really realize that it, it's not the color of your skin; it's the ability of the individual. I think that's what we are. Yeah, Doug is is it right on it. It starts with the family tree. You know, when you're growing up, your parents, your brothers, your uncles everybody that plays a role in, you know, when you're blessed with, you know, the ability that he has and the ability to play quarterback, they want to make sure that you stay on the right street, you know, don't get bad guys around you, get with the wrong crowd. Um, but seriously, I don't think Doug really know the impact that he had. I grew up a TSU Tiger, because that's, you know, my uh, elementary coach, took me to all the football games and basketball games there. And, you know, and these people thought because I was the number one blue chip coming out that TSU and Grambling wasn't on my radar, but they're crazy. They were on my radar, but that's what I watch. I see Grambling TSU play every year and, you know, and, and that inspired me. And, and then, then when you think about it, when you have the, the opportunity to, to go and make a statement, or to go and go to a school that um, a lot of blacks wasn't attending or hadn't played quarterback at that school. You know, they didn't have black running backs and DBs and receivers, but never had a black quarterback. And we're talking about 1978. And so, you know, my whole thing was that Doug just mentioned was if you get if you just want the opportunity. Now, what I didn't like, they give you the opportunity but they want you to be Superman when you're on their court. You can't throw interceptions. You can't fumble the ball. You pull, Every time you touch it, you're supposed to take it to the house. Well, because the color of my skin, I'm supposed to be able to do that because it's something that they're not used to. But the white guy could come in and hand the ball off, and they go down the field, 15-play drive. He never throw a pass, but he the greatest thing since – Sliced bread, you know, so they pass judgment on you. And then as a 17-year-old, you know, you stand back and you look and you go, you know, these people are crazy. This, this, it, they, they think I'm not smart enough to coordinate a huddle, to 
call a play, to change a play, you know, and so you had to break the barrier. And you, you know, it's, it's a traditionally rich school that's always had the best white players that wanted to go there. And then when SMU went and got a Jerry Levise and some other players that can stretch the field, Texas ain't beating them 50 to nothing. It's 20 to 17 now, you know. They didn't, they didn't close the gap. So they had to go out and get, you know, Roosevelt Leakes and, a, and a Earl Campbell. And, and then, a Donnie Little. <laughs> you know, well, and, and then the times had changed. So, you know, nobody, especially myself, you know, you you got 80,000 people in the stands and you hear the, you know, get that in out of there and they oh, yeah. calling all these racial slurs and, you know, you got to have thick skin, even when you play quarterback, you know, regardless of what all the stuff going on that ain't on the field. But um, my whole perspective was kill them with kindness. They ain't going to run me off, you know, um, looking, it wasn't just for me looking for someone behind me the Andre Wares and the Vince Youngs and the Jane Browns, you know, they they get that opportunity to come there and they don't have to go through the stuff that I had to go through. Yeah, I, I think, I, you know, I think you gotta, we got to take our hat off to, to Donnie because let me tell you, his, his journey was probably tougher than mine going to the University of Texas as a quarterback back then. That that wasn't an easy thing to, to, to just find yourself maneuvering in. Because like he just said, and I, and I can I can concur with him. He, he's right. They expect you to be Superman. You can't make a mistake. Uh, yeah. Because at the end of the day, they're not used to seeing you back there, number one. So if you're back there, you know, you, you're supposed to be able to work magic. <laughs> if you cut your hand, something's supposed to happen to it. Not bummer, not interception. You got to get across the goal line. Yeah. So, you know, we, we sitting here tonight, you know, we talk about history. You know, we, we do have to that we do have to take our hat off to you going to the University of Texas during that time. See, going to University of Texas in 78 was like me going to Tampa in 78. I yeah. mean, it's almost the same thing. They expect me to be able to turn flips and do everything else to yeah. make it happen. And and that's what they expected from you in Texas. That's true. Well, what what Doug and Donnie, may, may I say this? To, to both of you respectfully before we get to the next question. First of all, you guys are phenomenal. Secondly, in all due respect to the dead, Coach Billy Manning, God rest the dead, and Coach Melvin Lee, when Coach Rob said to me, uh, Doug, in his office, he said, well, hell, hell, if you think you can get him, go get him. I said, Coach, he wants to come. And Melvin Lee, I love Melvin dearly, and Ron Manning did not believe that yeah, they yeah. could get it. In hindsight, God had a plan that I that he didn't tell me about. So I understand because as as we all know, it, you know, it takes a special kind of person to be able to deal with that because I, guys, I have to say this as we move on. I had no business playing ball at Louisiana Tech. I was not a Doug and a Dunny. I was raising hell every day. They ran me off the team. <laughs> they let, me, let me say this, man, and again for, for Donnie. You know, what Donnie was, when you look back at it, Forget about his athletic ability. Donnie was mentally tough. Because, you know, you, you can't be weak of heart to go in where he went in and, 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 and be able to facilitate and, and go out there and play. You had to be mentally tough to go through what he went through. That is true. That is true. Wow. Well, gentlemen, look, I, I have a – listen, have you ever given much thought to the fact that in your position – Leadership was and remains a requirement that could not be compromised. Have you ever thought about that or just something that you did because that was just a part of who you are? <laughs> you, know, you know, this this is my thing, take on leadership. My thing is some things are taught and some things are caught. You <laughs> cannot teach leadership. Yep. You can't teach it. it. It's something that comes with the individual. And I think you know, when, when you when you got a team there, everybody always look to see who's the captain. You can't pick captain. Captain shows up. A leader shows up. And I tell you this, as an athlete, being in the locker room, being around it, players, players know who leaders are because they tend to follow them. Now, some of them follow the leaders the wrong way. But I'm talking about real leaders on the team, players find out who they are, who they are real quickly. So... You can't teach leadership. You got to have it. You got to catch it. 
That's true. That's how, that's how I feel about leadership. That's true. You know, when I walked in the huddle at Texas, obviously these dudes, my linemen, you know, took took me to war. They wanted to see what I was made of, you know, and a lot of this stuff was done off the field, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, took me hunting, never been hunting in my life, and, you know, threw up with Copenhagen and ain't, Ain't shot nothing. All we did was drink and have Copenhagen in your mouth. And I'm like, man, this stuff is overrated. I don't, I don't think I want to go hunting anymore. But that's part of being accepted, too, you know. And it's not so much they miss a block, but it may be that I'm trying to conduct the huddle and they don't even clap when you break the huddle. And then, you know, you got to just take charge. You're like, yo. Come on back, guys. Hey, huddle up, man. Come on. You get forceful with them. And that's what they're expecting from you. And what leadership taught me was in high school. We had some success, bought a community together, won a state championship. And a kid was in the eighth grade, Andre Ware. I gave him a football after a game. You fast forward to Andre Ware winning the Heisman. And Donnie Little is his idol. And Donnie Little this, Donnie Little that. I said, man, I'll don't even know this kid. I couldn't pick him out because he was young. I finally, I finally caught him and I said, man, I don't know what, what I did, but I appreciate you, you know, giving me you, you, all these props of that I'm your role model and da da da. You got Warren Moon, Doug Wim, Joe Gilliam, man, come on. And he's like, man, you don't know what you did to me. And that kind of put a nerve on me. Like the way we conduct ourselves when we have a little success. Right. You can't act like you're on top of the world and you're better than everybody else. And if you treat everybody the same, you just never know who you might touch. And that was an experience I had that, that really grounded me because he, he didn't have to do that. You know, right. he had other players he could choose as his role model, but he was honest about it. And, and whatever I did in high school, you know, I go talk to kids, obviously, and all of that, it paid dividends for me. Now that that says a lot. That says an awful lot. And yeah. I can see that. You know, you 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 touch people, you don't even know you're touching. That's true. Being a how you, and you you hit the nail on the head is how you carry yourself, you know, and go back to family and, and I'm sure you the same way. My mom used to tell us all the time, bless the soul, is is that if you don't put yourself too high, you won't have that for the fall. <laughs> That's true. I love that. <laughs> hey guys, um one of my former students, and I'm I'm glad he's here. Uh, uh, Patrick, he, who's, who's retired from the Air Force, is asking a question. He says, how would, how would you both describe your individual leadership styles? And then he says, uh, some people are, are quiet and demanding. Some are in your face. Some are just get it done and others follow. So he's asking, how would you guys describe your style? That's, that's, a, that's a good question. I think as a player, it was follow me. Because they knew I was going to give them everything I had when it comes. It was all about winning to me. It wasn't about stats. It wasn't about all that kind of stuff. It was about W-I-N. And that's as a team, not individual. I didn't care who got the credit. You know, like Coach Rob used to always say, the credit goes to the man in the arena. And, and I didn't care how we got it, as long as we found a way to win. And I'm going to give you everything I had to win. Now, as a coach, it was, it was a totally different thing because I was, I was fortunate enough to play for Eddie play for Joe Gibbs, Woody Wooden, Hartford, Frank Cush, uh, John McKay. And and I and what I did, I watched all those guys and see how they handle certain things. Everybody handled stuff a little different. Um, from Coach Rob's standpoint, it's about being honest, being straightforward. I remember Coach Rob used to tell us that, you know, he ain't got no feelings. He left his feelings at home in the drawer. So, I mean, you got to work and earn what, what you want yeah. to earn. Uh, Joe Gibbs was a guy, Joe knew who he had to get in his face. He know who he just had to get a thumb up, and some of them he just don't say nothing. I, I think it's all about how you handle people. This is a people game, and you can't That's handle true. everybody the same. You got to find out who you're dealing with and, and, and how you got to handle them. That's true. And, you know, Coach Lars, you can, um, you can lead by your performance. Some people, a lot of people ain't raw, raw, raw kind of people. You know, you just, you, you get in the huddle, you get it called, you get it done. And when you're doing good things and you're leading by your performance, you don't have to say a lot. You know, you just, you, 
these guys are counting on you to, to execute to the best of your ability. And so you don't have to be a raw, raw, raw guy, but there are times in a game that the situation may call for that. You know, you, you get on your line when you tell your running backs, hey, let's get this done. So everybody is different in their leadership style. You know, it's, it's some just lead by performance, some are raw, raw. And it's, you know, it's good to have a little bit of, of both, you know, when you're the quarterback because you're the guy running the show. Great. Well, gentlemen, let me ask you this now. The world at large loves to discuss legends. And, 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 and we know, uh, Doug, you hail from Zachary, Louisiana. And Dunny Hills from Dickinson, Texas. Now, how do the two of you embrace the fact that you are indeed legends? And I want to ask this question. And it, it's a perfect segue, actually, from what you guys are just finished explaining. Because as most of us know, people have a tendency to think that you have to come from some large city or some fancy situation in order to become a legend or to become a, re a true leader. Uh, Zachary is a modestly sized town. Dickinson is a modestly sized town. But we're sitting here speaking with two legends. Well, Will you ever feel comfortable if, when, if people refer to you as a legend or, or, or would you prefer they not to, not do that? Well, I, I, from my standpoint, first of all, you know, you, you gave us a little too much credit, Zach. We're a small town, man. We're not more on the side. But, but, but anyway, legend to me is, is, is something I can't go out. I would never, you'll never hear me ever walk up to somebody and say, hey, man, I'm a legend. That, that's not for me to decide. Yeah. That's, that's for, if that's what a person thinks, I mean, ain't nothing I can do about it. Uh, it's good to hear, but at the same time, you got to be real with yourself. Are you really a legend? You know, you got to look around and, and think about all the people that came before you and what they did. See, I look at a guy like, see, James Harris is a legend to me. Mm -hmm. Joe, Joe Gilliam is a legend to me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, them, to me, that's them legends. And I would never look at it and say, you know what, I'm a legend too. That's not for me to do. And, and to me, um, legends are something that I, I don't even know how to describe what a legend is, but I hear it all the time. People... A lot of a lot of the players in this league now, when they look at me, they call me OG, you know. And and, and some of them say the myth, the legend, or what have you. And if whatever that means, that that's fine. If it, if it's something positive, I take it. But but I don't think, and I, and I don't know what dining, but I would never walk out the house and say, "Hey, I'm the legend." That that's not for me to do. Yeah. But, you know, Coach Lawrence, I'm a I'm gonna tell you, the legend is the guy we're talking to, but he's too modest. <laughs> Okay, let me tell you okay. why. The success at Gremlin, okay, the success at Tampa Bay, and all that, all that equal when he went to the Redskins, and all to, for two weeks, all you hear is John Elway, John Elway and the Denver Broncos, Don Elway, John Elway. My house is full with 50 people, and they all look like me. <laughs> and we pray for the brother. We, he's on the biggest stage. We've never had a black man get that far. And we're sitting here and hell, we watch every play. People wouldn't even, that smoke wouldn't even take a smoke break. <laughs> they, they, they watched every play. Me too. Of game because this is, the, this is the Super Bowl. And to see somebody that looked like us out on that field and Going into the game is all about John Elway and the Denver Broncos. And they gave, as like Washington had no chance, you know. And, and when Doug went out and performed the way he did, it just killed, killed all the naysayers. It, you know, they, they couldn't believe it, you know. They, um, the, what they saw was no excuse. They couldn't make an excuse for it. So when you're on a stage like that, and you deliver, and you're modest, you know, you didn't see Doug jumping up and down and turning cart flip, but inside, he may have felt that way. But he knew that all this kind of like Jordan deal we just saw when Jordan was on the bench yeah. and whispering and telling the guy, be ready, you know, because you know the cameras are on him. That's Doug. He's in that moment. And man, every household that looked like me, we, we couldn't be more blessed 
We couldn't be more happy for an individual. We couldn't be more excited. And, you know, the prayers was answered and he earned and, 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 and achieved everything that came his way. And it's unfortunate that it took the Super Bowl, but that's the biggest game. But he already had made his mark before he even got to the Super Bowl. But you, we all know the Super Bowl brings a lot more when you go and win it, you know. So, man, I just don't think, you know, if Doug doesn't know, I'm sure he does. Man, there's so many households and so many black people that were touched, you know, well, and so that. excited and so happy for him. And, you know, just it's like we gave us life again that we can go out and do this. You know, and to see a brother do that and and do it with 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 so much passion and respect and just it you know is unbelievable. It really was, man. So 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 proud of that moment. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Man. That's the legend, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> now the only well, other know, person I met that's a legend. But you know what, Donnie? I hey man, I, I'm with you, man. My 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 household was doing the same thing. And uh, I have, let me say this briefly, you know, I met Doug when he was at Grambling with uh, my cousin and my friend. But, you know, a lot of times the relatives are not friends, but Hans and I were tight and Big Hans Johnson. And he, he, he listen, Doug, Doug probably don't know this because Hans was never really good at expressing himself, he but he was in awe of Doug, man. He was in awe of Doug, uh, even when, uh, I say even, when Doug was playing at Tampa Bay and that kind of thing, man, he, Hans and I were sitting down talking, man, and it was after the season, and some sportscaster, and Hans never cussed, man, and some sportscaster was making some negative remark, you know, about an interception or something. And, and, and God rest the dead, Doug, you, you never heard this. And Big Hands <laughs> said, you low down, MF for F for F for I was shocked because he, he never really cursed. <laughs> He said, man, this man the best best quarterback in the NFL. And, and and if you get big hands fired up and he starts talking, man. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> so I had to share that with Doug. Absolutely. And Doug allowed me to say to you and Donnie both before I, I shut up and listen to you guys. There's never a second first. You know, there is never a second first. And for both of you gentlemen being as modest as you are and as kind as you are, and as you've already said, uh, Doug, as before it references Dunny, and as Dunny is saying to you, is that people don't get it. Yes, you, you are a legend, Doug. You are a legend. Yes, he is. And, and, and Dunny, amazing. you are a legend as well, brother. And you yes. have to receive that because there's never a second first. I don't care mm -hmm. how many people come behind you. I don't care how many awards they win, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And, and I say, I know most of the young people are, are crazy about Michael Jordan. But when we look at Bill Russell, Bill Russell has 11 rings. Yeah. Two as a coach, nine as a player. So they can call Jordan and go to all they want. Everybody can see that Jordan is an imitation of Dr. J. So, see, there's never a second, Doug Williams, and there's never a second done a little. So I'm going to shut up. But listen, in this country, black men and, and legacy are very rarely mentioned in the same conversation. Now, in your private time, have you or do you think about your legacy? And you guys have already told me you don't call yourselves that. And what it means to little boys, done it, address that and little girls that will hear of you long after God has given you your wings. I, you know what? I think it's all about family number one. I, you know, I have a son, DJ, uh, working for the Saints. And just before Father's Day, he, he texts me. I don't know whether you read the article or not. That, that was an article out and it had the whole text in there. You know, I had the clear blue. Didn't see it. Go ahead. But to me, that's my legacy because he explained it in his text what I meant to him. And, and, and what I have done for him to, to give him the opportunity uh, to be where he is now, you know, working with the Saints. But it's not just for him, but all my kids, you know, that they, they look up to their daddy. They know who their daddy You know, it ain't about spoiling them. It's about being honest and, and, and being straightforward, not only with them, but whoever I come in contact with. 
Uh, you can ask either one of my kids, and they say you anything about their daddy. The first thing they're gonna tell you, he gonna say what's on his mind. And and to me, it's the legacy of a positive image that you leave with your family. If you do that with your family, it'll take care of the rest of the people. That's yes, what it's sir. Like. Yes, sir. Well, <laughs> well, you know, yeah. Coach, I, I keep harping on this, but if Doug Williams, when he was in the NFL, if he would have been partying all night, if he would have been, you know, out like Joe Namer, drinking before the Super Bowl, blah, 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 that wouldn't be a Steve McNair. That wouldn't be some other black quarterbacks that are following now because when he held the position, it was him and maybe one or two others. It wasn't a whole lot, one or two others. So it wasn't just his performance on the field, it's how he's conducting himself off the field if these billionaires are going to invest into another brother that looks like him to play quarterback for their team. Now, I'll give you an example. I was Vince Young's mentor at Texas. I was working there. Vince Young's a hell of an athlete and a great kid. But when you make some bad decisions off the field, you can get blackballed out the NFL. You can't tell me when this kid, good as he was, that there's 30 other quarterbacks, or even if they're holding the notepad, that's better than him. But we don't get that opportunity. Yeah. You know, and Doug... Doug did everything the right way, so the Steve McNairs and all these Mahomes and all these kids coming now is having that opportunity. That opportunity for Doug was slim. There's a lot open. And right. the way he conducted himself gave us an opportunity that if he would have did some crazy things off the field, they might have said, you know, we tried this and we're right. going to go the other way now, you know. So when you said being a, a leader and a trailblazer and all that, that, that's more important or just as equally important as his performance on the field. Agreed. Agreed. But listen, quick question. Was there ever a time, guys, and, and, and this is for both of you, because, you know, as athletes, we, we're used to noise and people – cheering. Now, was there ever a time you had difficulty adjusting to the silence of the crowd when the crowd stopped cheering? Well, I was hoping, you know, when the crowd stopped cheering, I was hoping we was at somebody else's stadium and we, we quieted them down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing that I was hoping. But, but you know what? You, you love a crowd. But yeah. at the end, end of the day, is between those lines. And what happened between, whether or not it was a scrimmage, a regular practice or what have you, your job is to do the best you possibly can. You know, people always say practice make perfect. And and, and I agree if it's a perfect practice. <laughs> you know, you just can't go out there and practice if you're not trying to get it right. But but as far as the crowd, you know, you, you like a crowd. I think everybody like crowd. But at the same time, you can't play for the crowd. You got to play for the team and yourself. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's the end of the day. That's what it's all about. That's true. My, my experience, Coach Lars, when, when, when I was at Texas, you know, you have some good games. You have some mediocre games. But, again, as we talk, we got to be on our A game every time. But I met with city officials who said that they left the game at halftime uh, if we were behind and I wasn't playing up to their expectations and they're like, I'm not coming back to this stadium, man. These white folks going to make me kill kill them using the N-word like they're in their own home. Oh, exactly. Just being abusive. And I had to meet with them and I told them, man, that's what they want us to do, not come. I, gotta, I need y'all there. <laughs> I need you there to support. Don't let them run us off, bro, you know, in order to create do. Right. You know, in order to create change, you gotta, you gotta just keep going. You can't just let them win like that. You know, you right. gotta, you gotta just, just, you know, it, it's gonna change. You ain't gonna do everything great and right, but you just keep at it. Well, Donna, allow me to say to you and Doug, man. I hey, Doug, I, I have to say very honestly, is that 
I rode into to this man's town. I was the first black varsity uh, uh, coach they hired, and I, I did uh, most of my duties with the freshmen and stuff, which I kind of anticipated was another story. But I rode into this man's town, and on their water tower, it says, home of the fighting gators. <laughs> and I think I told Gunner this story. Uh, I had already been cut as a freezer from the Oilers. I'm mad about that. I have to go take a regular job. And I roll in town and I see this sign, but I knew they had won a ball game in nine, what, eight or nine years, done it? Before yeah. you started playing? You're right. Well, right. I, I think it was like eight or nine years. So I roll in town and I'm asking myself, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and I met Donnie Little and the rest is history. I mean, man, this kid was phenomenal. And, and I, I, have, I wanna give him his props nat nationally. Uh, you know, man, they, he, he hadn't played football before. Uh, I know uh, that I'd heard. And he, he, he came out there, took that team, man, and led us to an undefeated season. Uh, the first team went to the playoffs. I think it was Orange Stark, wasn't it, Dunning? And uh, that we lost in the playoffs the next year. They won the state championship and stuff like that, man. So I was determined, Doug, and, that, and that, that's why I want you to know that this young man right here, not, not that he needs me to, to back him up, but he was determined to come to Grambling because of Doug Williams. And we did everything yeah. within our power. And, and, and that's why I'm saying to this day, God rest the dead, Coach Rob is asleep. But Dunning, Coach Rob, you probably thought I was just saying it to make you feel better. He wanted you there. And the main guys, and I'm not maligning them, and one of them is going to sleep, but they just did, could not fathom that yeah. you having all of those scholarships to offers to Texas and Oklahoma and all of that stuff that you would leave Texas and come to Grambling. So I just wanted to reiterate that again with, with Doug, as you were sharing with him, the impact and that kind of thing that he's had on you. None of us are oblivious yeah. to the past, the present, and our ongoing state of affairs right now in America. But when referencing people of color, statues, changing names of buildings, et cetera, Will you share your thoughts about that? Because all of us are aware of all this craziness with, with uh, George Floyd not being able to breathe and people trying to dismiss all of this racism that's real. Can you guys share, share with us a little bit, you know, some of your thoughts about that and, and, and what you think we need to do? And I know, uh, Doug, I was talking to Dunny yesterday and he mentioned Earl Campbell coming to his hometown. Talking I read, I read, I read <laughs> I keep on with it, but, but let, let me say this first bit before I get into that. Hey, Donna, I just want to say this, man. This is a pleasure meeting you, and um, after this old wit, you know, give Melvin your number, and Melvin, I want you to send me Donnie's number, man, because uh, just like Donnie talking about me, you know, I remember Donnie Little playing in Texas, too, so it's it's a two-way street there. I appreciate um, it, brother. And as far as the statues, let, let's be honest, you know, and, and I'm glad we at this point. Uh, we shouldn't be here. Uh, like I said earlier on a couple of interviews that I've done, uh, I'm old enough to to have went through the first civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But that's when they were sicking dogs and putting the, the hose pipes on our people who was marching. It was mostly older black Americans and very few white people. And when the white people marched, you know, usually you didn't find them the next morning. But But to see what has transpired over the last few weeks, the diversity and the age of it makes me feel a lot better this time around than it was back then. I was young back then, and, and you know, I grew up in the South, and, you know, I seen crosses burning. I seen some of them Ku Klux Klan hoods. I, I think when, when I lost power, I lost him. And about uh, the statues and all of this uh, injustice stuff that's going on right now, right? Okay, well... Earl, Earl came here, you know, Earl is from Tyler, and he came here and um, he met with the superintendent and he met with the board and told them that he really are a big advocate for changing John Tyler and Robert E. Lee. So they asked him, what are you, you know, are you okay with changing John Tyler High School with all the memories? He said, I got my memories. But this man was a slave owner, and that that that's that name needs to be changed. We need to do the right thing by these young kids that are protesting and 
and and don't want to go to a school that a man was a slave owner. So, you know, there's um that's a big topic here. Uh, the board is going to meet next week again to see if that's going to pass. So, it's uh you know Tyler is a little different, and it's um something that will be bought 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 to their uh, attention, and and there's going to be change. That really is. That's a great thing, Donnie, because it, it, it while I hate we lost Doug because he he was cranked up with that. We're gonna have to get get this thing again, get that last in. But it doesn't matter. I, I'm so happy that you, you are sharing with us uh, about Earl and and uh, because it take people that have some clout to That's make a true. noise. And no matter That's what true. people say, uh, yeah. is that well, you know, did you keep politics? No, 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 no. We need to stand up. So I'm happy that that uh, you are sharing with us that uh, Earl has come to his hometown and has expressed uh, his, his displeasure and that kind of thing. And that's why I had to throw in and tell you guys, I got ran away from tech, man. I play football. I mean, hey, until people stand up and express them, and, and, and some of us are sacrificial lambs, and that's just, that, that yeah. just the way it is. And I, I, I wish Doug was still on, because I really would like to know his take on Cody Kaepernick. You know, I mean, it's just the NFL has said that they – screwed up you know it's been three four years and i'm sure he's not the same player as, as he was then colin should um i think that i feel there's some, some teams should give him a shot but are they going to give him a realistic shot you know he lost three four pivotal years in his prime and hadn't played football for that long he may not be the same quarterback he was when you know he took a knee back then, but you know I think the NFL should offer him something in the NFL as a job, you yeah. know, and they 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 ruin his career because it's you know he's he lost three pivotal years in his prime, and he's no he and again the guy did. It for social injustice, not to disrespect the flag. And mm -hmm. these people finally then came around and seen that that's what he was doing. But it took three years for that to happen, you know? You know, it, you know, Dunny, absolutely. And I'll be honest with you, Dunny. My my take all along was that they understood exactly what he was doing from the beginning. But yeah. You know, um, sadly, we live in a country where, and, and, and by the way, Dunny, I don't know if I ever told you, but I, I call white people my less melanated brothers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but sadly, we live in a country where our less melanated brothers have done an excellent job of deflecting and, and changing the narrative of what takes place. They understood exactly what he was talking about from the beginning. You know, just, just like uh, when the people started rioting. They tried to take the narrative away from the murders and try to focus on, well, they shouldn't be burning buildings. Well, hey, hey, nobody's trying to hear that because first of all, it's not even about that. If you have a few people that's doing something they should not be doing, then okay, we got it. But let's that's get right. back to the let's get back to the topic. So yep. that in in and of itself, man, was you know, it, it kind of reminded me of Muhammad Ali uh, doing doing his heyday because he refused to go to the military. So. As, as Doug was talking about growing up in that, Doug and I grew up in the same period. And I'm a couple of years older than Doug. And, you know, man, when you have situations where there's no respect, and, and that's why I'm saying to you again, and I, I hope Doug gets back. I think that's him calling me now. Okay. Well, we just wanted his take on uh, Colin Kaepernick. Does he think the NFL, you know, they admitted that they dropped the ball on him, but do you think it's fair that after the guy ain't played Kaepernick. in three, three years? I, I, think, I, think, I think the problem with Kaepernick was the fact that what they didn't do, they didn't look at what the kid was kneeling for. Uh, it's unfortunate, you know, that there was so much made out of, out of that situation from the, from the um, house down on Black, Black Lives Matter Avenue in D.C. And, and the people were afraid to stand up for Kaepernick. So they went against him because that's what the man said, that he was kneeling for the flag. And a lot of Americans looked at that as a bad thing. And actually, it's unfortunate that uh, these policemen kneeled on uh, George Floyd's neck to, to understand exactly why Kaepernick was kneeling. 
And right. I think they felt like they owed him an apology. But, you know, three years out of the league is a long time. And now it's a matter of some team standing up and uh, giving him an opportunity to play and not looking at what they say down in Washington, D.C. as well. Now that's nearly for the flag. I think we passed. I think we passed the nearly for the flag thing now. Right. I think everybody see that that's not what it was about. I got you. Well said, bro. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, gentlemen, uh, you've heard from none other than Mr. Doug Williams and Mr. Donnie Little. Both of these gentlemen are first, and they both are, are American icons. And as all of you guys know, there can only be one first. And uh, Doug, Doug, is there a way? I know that 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 we're not giving personal information. But if, 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 if people have questions or anything like that for you, additional questions, uh, is there an email or something I can give them, or would you just prefer yeah, they... You can, you, can, you can give them on, on my last name, which is Williams, and my first initial, which, which is D, at redskins.com. Okay, okay. And, 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 make, and make sure you sign it. Get my number and make sure you send me Donnie's number. Yeah. Brother Doug, I, I, um, I appreciate him being here today. I, I love the brother and, and bless him and his family. Okay. Donnie says he appreciates you. He loves you and bless you and bless you and your family. Okay. Okay, Donnie, it's been great. Patrick, thank you for coming to join us. Uh, I, I wish you would come on the screen, brother, but thank you for joining us. Great night, Donnie. I'm going to forward you Doug's uh, telephone number, and I'm going to forward yours to him. Awesome. Show this to Cutting Earl. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I, I, I'm still waiting to meet him. It was in 1997. I was holding these NFL camps down in Dick in Adrian, Michigan. And uh, uh, Earl and I were, were talking about, at, which was my great-grandmother. And her name was O.C. Campbell. And she was 111 years old uh, before passing. And we were discussing her. He, he invited me to come to Austin uh, several times. And I kept putting it off. So I, I guess maybe he thought I was just messing around. I know you heard this story before, Donnie. But uh, just just let the brother know that uh, I still admire him greatly, have the utmost respect for him, and the next time he's in Tyler, if he will let me know, I would love to come over and say hello. Awesome, I will. Okay, and I will, uh, brother. Uh, Pat, you are you are on site. Uh, thank you more than anything. Thank you. Uh, you know, from a young man perspective, we just appreciate it, and we know that uh, what we had to go through was so much easier because you guys had it so hard. So for what you, I couldn't imagine what you were going through, like I said, at the University of Texas and having to arrive on that campus and being the first. Uh, and again, I, I was thinking about when you, when you, when you mentioned uh, you had to be basically superhuman. You know, you had to be superhuman, but then when you performed normal, and, and that's and that's a word we use, right? Normal, something's wrong with you, and you yeah. should be on the field. But to have that expectation, man, I don't think people understand the, the walk that you guys had to do, and we're just appreciative of it uh, because where your 110% was, a lot of guys aren't really even performing at that level now, and they do, because they're they're just thinking about the field. You had to come from the field to the campus. Uh, to the city itself, right? Because people are still recognizing who you are. So we just thank you for your sacrifice uh, and and just keep motivating guys like us. Well, I sure appreciate the kind words, brother. I really do. Thank you very much. And, right. and if I could share real quick with you, I would like to say, you know, bringing a James Brown and a Vince Young to that campus um, really solidified what I went through. It really, that's the reason because you want people that look like you to come up behind you and do that. But if it was the ultimate compliment that came when I was with Earl Campbell and he had Gail Sales with him, and the first time I ever met Gail Sales, and he walked up to me, I introduced myself, and he said, uh, Man, brother, I appreciate you. You're a pioneer. You know, a lot of people couldn't have handled the, the situation the way you did. When that man said that, I was God sent, bro. <laughs> That's one, besides Doug Wills being my mentor and, and role model, you know, Gail Sells, you know, we all 
saw a piccolo song and all that. And for here's a guy at Penn State and played in Chicago. I had no clue he was watching Texas football. And that just meant the world to me. So I appreciate your kind words. I appreciate thank you. Wow. Patrick, thank you very much for, for being here with us. Uh, Doug, I will definitely be in touch. And, and listen, Patrick is there in Texas also. Uh, Pat, are, are, are you still in San Antonio? Still in San Antonio, holding it down. And that's okay. why I actually put in the, uh, the comment. Uh, I left Grambling in 1997 uh, to join the Air Force in April when uh, still I was, you know, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I was on a path. I left in April of 97. I came home in November of 97 to go home to the Bayou Classic. At that time, that was Coach Robinson's last year. And wow. I was going to tease him before he got off here, but actually Doug got off. But Doug snuck out of the banquet. <laughs> and when he snuck out of the banquet, I was on the hallway just having to be, and I see this big tall guy, and I said, man, that looks like Doug. So we go over and we start having a chat, and I tell him, uh, that I just joined the Air Force. And man, let me tell you, we we probably talked about 30, 40, 45 minutes when he's supposed to be inside. All right. <laughs> and uh, we just had a good time, man. That's why uh, the humbleness of you, of the, you gentlemen, I know you talked about being a legend. I mean, here in my, here in my eyes is a legend. Absolutely. Who was basically taking the time and talking to me like we've been best friends forever. Absolutely. And uh, when he left that conversation, he just said, man, stick it out, go in there. And, and, and it was, I wasn't on a football team, but I think he understood where I was going. And again, it was a, an environment where we have to be different. We, yeah. have, to be at that, we have to be at a hundred percent. So um, that encouragement took me 22 years, just last year in September, where I, you know, I held it, hung, up my, uh, hung up my uniform, but little things like that, man, I'm just telling you, it makes a difference. So brothers are like, Doug, uh, yourself, Miss Little. I mean, it's just, just keep inspiring us. Just keep talking to us. We're listening. That's awesome. That's awesome. Good stuff there. All right, gentlemen. Have a great night. And Pat, uh, Doug, we'll get to hear you say this firsthand because uh, once I get this video edited up, it, it's, it's going to all be put together. And Doug is going to have this, and Donnie both. They, they'll have these, this in their in their archives. So you did get an opportunity to deliver your message to him personally, and he'll probably give you a call. Awesome. So gentlemen, have a great night. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been the Nobody Asked to Me Guy show. I'm your host, Melvin Casey Lars, and as always, we're excited when you're here with us. Uh, just get ready, guys, because we have some great programs coming down the pike. I want everybody to have a great and blessed night. Uh, Mr. Donnie Little, we will be in touch again, sir. Uh, Mr. Patrick Stewart, it's so great having you here. Uh, hope, Donnie, hopefully we can get you and Earl on, uh, on the show one, one day, man. I'll Let's work on it, brother. No, please I'll do, work. brother. Please okay. do. Have, Patrick, have a great night, I'm guys. Told, man. Tell Patrick thanks, and Coach Lars, love you, bro, and God bless you. Love you, man. Y'all have a great night. All right. <laughs>